A lot of good football out there, Coach. A lot of big upsets this weekend. That's why I can't wait. Week to week, every game matters. You never have the same team two weeks in a row, particularly if you had a great win one week, you aren't going to have a great football team the next week. It's just the way it is. I never had the same team two weeks in a row, and I coached for a lot of years. Well, we're going to see how that goes because if you look at this past week, people say number two, number six, number seven, they lost. Well, guess what? So did 15, 16, 19, and 21. Five of the top 25 lost to unranked teams. Now, we're going to talk about quite a few of those in our review, but I want to talk about number six. So before we talk about, though, I'm going to go back to week one. Did a little research. You know, coaching myself for history majors. Mark, I don't know if you were too, but only we got three history majors. We cannot go wrong, okay? This is golden. Here's why. Because all the way back in week one, it was the premiere of the Crowdsign College Football Show with Lou Holtz and Mark May. Mark May said, he said, every time that West Virginia gets high expectations, especially under Dana Holgerson, they don't meet those expectations. So what does number six, uh, West Virginia, Will Greer, Heisman Trophy winner, the Heisman Trophy candidate, goes into Ames, Iowa at night against a freshman quarterback, Brock Purdy, Mark, you saw that. What are your thoughts on that? Well, upset? just what I thought about West Virginia, that's the way they've always been. They've got a high-flying offense. They've always got questions on defense. I thought their defense would be better this year, and they were better this year in certain circumstances, but they can't get over the hump every time they face adversity, particularly on the road. They can't win against decent football teams, and if they face good football teams, they're definitely not going to win. The schedule's only going to get tougher for West Virginia from here on out. Well, there's no way they were going to go undefeated. No matter what happened, whether they lost a game week one or week nine, you would have said the same thing. That's my home state. <laughs> they have a good football program. We played them for the national championship. They were undefeated. They had a great football team in. They've had a lot of good football teams. There's a lot of pride there. The season's not over. There'll only be one undefeated team when this whole season's over. It won't be West Virginia, but they will be in a bowl. You're going to see, because uh, I know I'm going to hear about it, when I go home for Thanksgiving to West Virginia with the in-laws, because they'll be talk still talking about why are they at the college football playoff. Now, you have some other good things that happen. For some people, Auburn lost to Tennessee after losing to Mississippi State. Is there some kind of new blood? Is there some new energy down there in Knoxville? What do you think, Mark, about those I volunteers? think Jeremy Pruitt is the right guy at the right time. Phil Fulmer, the athletic director, did a terrific job in going out and searching for the right coach for this program. Everyone panicked early when they lost games early that they thought they were going to win. But just like Phil Fulmer, they're very patient in this situation. They knew Jeremy Pruitt would turn his football team around. They don't have all the pieces yet. It's his first year there. They're covered with less bare. But I think he's doing one heck of a job at Tennessee right now, Coach. Oh, they're getting better each and every week. You can see it from their opening loss. I think it was to West Virginia. I might remind you, Mark. But they, they had a quarterback named Garantino. He wasn't even on the two deep. Paul Chris was going to be the quarterback, the transfer from Stanford. But they just keep building the program, building it. And to beat Auburn on the road is very, very impressive. Well, there's eight remaining undefeated teams in the country. And three of them are in one single conference, the American Athletic Conference. So that's going to equal out. Two of those, Clemson and NC State, are both undefeated in the ACC. They play against each other this weekend. So all these things are going to kind of get sorted out. So with that said, let's talk about this past week and what has led to all these upsets. What we're going to do is we're going to go and look at our college football show contest and our Rapid Five contest from week seven. Let's talk about the Week 7 College Football Show Contest. We picked four games in that contest. Number two, at L or Georgia at LSU in Baton Rouge in the daytime. Mark, you won that one. Number 17, Oregon at number seven, Washington. So what happened. Oregon won in overtime. Coach, you picked Oregon. 15, Wisconsin at number 12, Michigan. Coach, you picked that one as well because the Wolverines did not, they left no doubt. And Pitt at number five, Notre Dame. And it was a close one. And Mark, the most inspiring speech we've seen since, you know, rock me. I don't know, but almost. We'll talk about that. Coach, you won that outright. But let's talk about the number two Bulldogs go into Baton Rouge. And it probably wasn't, I don't care what anybody says, it wasn't really close. They shut them down. Look at Jake Fromm. Jake Fromm had 
two interceptions. He was sacked three times. LSU, Coach O, has some defense, have a smart quarterback. Mark, what's your thoughts on this and how this shakes out for the rest of the Well, you can't the turn the ball over, it's plain and simple, and you spe- especially you can't do it on the road. And if you look at Georgia, they had four turnovers. LSU had none. And I think the key to this game, the rushing attack of LSU. They kept Georgia off the field. They had 275 yards on the ground. The running backs did a great job. But I still go back to their quarterback. The quarterback transfer from Ohio State, Joe Burrow. In this football game, wasn't spectacular throwing the ball 15 to 30 for 200 yards, but what he did running the football, advancing the football, 66 yards on the ground, coach two rushing touchdown. He is the leader of this football team. He inspires other players around him, and they believe in him. And when he's at home, he doesn't make mistakes. He's got zero interceptions on the season in Tiger Stadium. Well, when you approach a football team going into a game, first thing you say to them, Man, we have to be the most physical football team on the field. If we are the most physical football team on the field, let me know so at halftime we can get on the bus and go home. LSU averaged 5.4 yards per rush. It was a domination. But let's remember the week before they got beat by Florida in the last minute when they threw an interception. They came ready to play. There's no doubt about it. They dominated the game. And Jake Fromm was averaging... Oh, close to 70% completion for the year. He had less than 50% completion. It was a complete domination by a very, very good LSU football team, but I don't think they're a great football team. We did not see the proper Georgia team. I'm sure we'll see it against uh, Florida in a week. Well, next week, this week, they've got Mississippi State in Baton Rouge at night. We'll see how that goes. And Georgia has a bye and they're going to then get ready to play what could be the SEC East Division Championship game when they go to Kroger Field, Commonwealth Stadium in two weeks in Lexington. Next game, number seven, Washington went to number seven, Oregon. And much like the Oregon-Stanford game, this one looked uh, somewhat similar, but it played out totally different. Oregon wins in overtime. Got to love it. C.J. Burdell, the running back from Oregon who uh, fumbled against Stanford, he scored the winning touchdown in overtime. Mark, you saw this game. Washington, you know, has a lot of injured players. Jake Browning, still a great player. What do you think about and not this? only the winning touchdown by C.J. Verdell, he had 111 yards rushing and another rushing touchdown in this football game. Hey, this is a hard-fought game. These two teams don't like each other. There's pure hate between these teams. And if you watch this game, and I watched every play flipping back and forth, it was a very physical football team. But I'll tell you one thing. Both these coaches did a heck of a job. And, Coach, you know when you go to overtime, anything can happen. One team scores a field goal, that's Washington. The other team scores a touchdown. They win the game, that's Oregon. And the reason why they won it, because they were more physical up front in the end. Washington was nicked up in this game. Gaskins, the running back, got hurt in this game. They weren't 100% in this game, but that's not an excuse. The bottom line, when you look at the Ducks, very resilient football team. They learned from their mistakes against Stanford earlier this year. They didn't make those same mistakes. They got the overtime, and they found a way to grind it out and win. Yeah, I predicted Oregon would win, Mark, for the same reason. Here's the amazing thing. The difference in that football game, on third down, Oregon was 9 for 18, and on fourth down, they were 3 of 3. When you go 12 out of 21 on critical downs and you convert it, and Washington was giving up less than 32% success on third down. Oregon did a great job, but it's great to see Verdell score the winning touchdown because he did it in overtime. That is the same young man that when they're running the clock out, all they got to do is fall on the ball. They gave it to Verdell, a freshman. He fumbled the ball and cost him the Stanford game. Here they come back a week or two weeks later in a critical time. They had the confidence to give him the ball. I am so happy that he had success. Two excellent football teams. Neither one of them are out of the conference race yet. And I can promise you one thing. Washington is cheering for Washington State this week (laughs) against Oregon. Because if Washington State wins, then once again, Washington will control its own destiny. Well, as you said, Coach, we're going to talk about both these teams again because Oregon is going up to Pullman to face the Pirate Mike Leach and his Washington State Cougars, and Washington's going to host the Wounded uh, Buffs from Colorado. Third game, number 15, Wisconsin, went into the big house, and it was 38-13, and Jim Harbaugh said, we're just going to run the ball. And, oh, by the way, Shea Patterson ran the ball. They all ran the ball, and the defense at Michigan stood up, and they ran the ball. See how this is going to go next week, but that was a big game because one that pushes uh, Michigan in their division, pushes them up, but oh, by the way, Wisconsin can still win the division on their side. They could play again, you never know. 
Mark, talk to us about this game in the Big Well, the out. star for Wisconsin, Jonathan Taylor, still rushed or 100 and two yards, I believe, in this football game. He's still got over 100 yards. He's one of the nation's leading rusher, but the problem was quarterback Alex Hornerbrook. Seven for 20, one touchdown and two picks. That's not getting it done. And then, Coach, they only had 11 first downs to Michigan's 21. And not only that, on third down, they were two for 11. When you go to the big house and you're two for 11 on third down, and you're the opposition, you're not going to get it done. My question was with, with Wisconsin is, where is the defense that they had last year? Last year, their defense was awesome. And I know they had to replace a lot of people, but they gave up a ton of yards and a ton of points earlier this season to Nebraska, and that's a winless football team. And then they go to the big house and they get stopped and they give up 38 points, but they could only put 13 points on the board. I love this Michigan defense. I think that they're outstanding. After that Notre Dame game, this is a different football team from top to bottom. Oh, no doubt. It's not the same Michigan football team. I think they have an excellent chance to win out. I think they have the best chance to beat Ohio State or maybe anybody else. I was very impressed with Michigan, but here's the amazing thing. You know, Hornibrook, Alex Hornibrook, he, he's a veteran quarterback. Going into the last five minutes of the game, Mark, he had less than 25 yards passing. What a great job by Michigan. And here's the amazing thing. When you hit it on the head, Mark, uh, Taylor averaged over five yards a carry. For the game, Wisconsin averaged 5.4 yards per rush. That's pretty good. Yeah. But it doesn't compare favorably if you only give them the ball. 15 to 20 times. On the other hand, Michigan rushed for 340 yards. When you rush the ball like that, and the biggest improvement in this offensive team for Michigan is their offensive line. I mean, they have each and every week, they've gotten better and better. When you take a good offensive line, you take a team that can run the ball, you have a great quarterback like Shea Patterson, an outstanding defense and a great punter, you have a chance against anybody. Let's congratulate Jim Harbaugh. He's done a tremendous job. All the naysayers a few weeks ago, I'm not sure he goes. The guy, you don't win at Stafford the way he did. Win with a 49, and he will win big at Michigan. He's got it going. But this week is critical for Jim Harbaugh in Michigan. Coach, we're going to talk about Michigan, Michigan State. Um, we're probably not going to talk much about Wisconsin, Illinois, because that's who they have next. But this next game was our fourth game of the college football show contest. And this game was started off with a pep talk the likes of which we haven't seen since whether it was Rockney whether it was the great Santini whether it doesn't matter Mark May gave the pep talk of all pep talks here it is right here to rise up and beat Notre Dame and so you have that pep talk and what happened waking up the echoes the Pittsburgh echoes the problem is Notre Dame leaned over after 50 minutes of football and they hit snooze and then they won the game 19 to 14 Mark Talk to us about this. Brian game. Kelly should have wore a mask to the press conference at the end of the game because they stole this. It was worse than Jesse James. If you saw the officiating in this game, I almost fell over backwards. Pass interference calls against Pittsburgh when they tip the ball, don't touch the wide receiver. But then, no, against the other side, it's a phantom call. And how about this? Roughing the passer. I want to tell you the exact words right here. The NBC rules expert in the booth said exactly. I would not have called roughing the passer on that play. That tells me a lot of home cooking in that stadium. Pittsburgh laid it out on the line. It was a great game to watch. It was a spirited game on both sides. Both teams were very physical right down to the end. But some of those calls, Coach, I got a question. And going back to 2012, the same thing happened. Remember the young tight end from Pitt? His name was Holtz, that's right. Holtz. His last name was Holtz. <laughs> and he got jobbed on a PI call that was a phantom call that should have been called. It hadn't been called. For some reason in the stadium, it's almost like playing in the shoe. That call is always going to go in Notre Dame's favor. Mark, winners laugh and tell jokes, losers say deal. You're always blaming somebody else. Now it's the official. How about the coach? That's the worst call I've seen on fourth down and three. That you're down by five. You got the ball basically in midfield. And three minutes to go in the game, you know they're going to be in a punt safe. What are you doing running the punt? If you're going to have somebody throw the ball, have your quarterback. Not a punter from Australia, I think it is. Uh, it was just incredible. But Notre Dame learned a lesson. And the thing about it, Mark, and we have to remember this, you can only have a team emotionally ready four times a year. Because for every height you have, you're going to have a depression. There's obvious looking at the season. Notre Dame had to be ready for Michigan, which they were. Had to be ready for Stanford, which they were. They will have to be ready uh, probably for Syracuse. But they have to be ready for Southern Cal. So when you play a pit, 
You, you play a Vanderbilt, you play a Ball State, you aren't going to be emotionally ready. You just go out there and you do your job, you win a game, and you move on from there. They're still undefeated. They didn't drop a bit in the ranking. And let me say this, Pitt put on a great performance there. I congratulate them, uh, but it's still a lot. <laughs> Touche. Coach Mark. I tell you what, I just, uh, I'm going to keep watching that pep talk because I showed it to my kids. And, uh, Mark, they're pretty fired up, and they haven't met you yet. They are excited about that. I, I, well, that was... I watched it when I played golf and shot 108. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't motivate me, Mark. Hey, Mark, I'll take 108. So, gentlemen, that was our Week 7 College Football Show Contest Review. Our Week 7 Rapid 5 Contest was... Uh, what? quite different than the college football show contest because here's what happened. Missouri at Alabama. Mark, you won that on a spread. Colorado, USC. Mark, you picked USC. UCF at Memphis. Mark, you won that on a spread. Baylor at Texas. Mark, you won that on the spread. But Michigan State at Penn State, we have to push that because neither one of you picked it. I did though. So, Let's talk about Missouri at number one, Alabama. Now, is this uh, maybe a participation trophy, or what's that one they give you, the 110% effort award at the end of the season? They kept Alabama under 50, and Tua hurt himself a little bit, got nicked up, but Jalen Hurts is a pretty good backup. So what do you see of this going forward, Mark? Talk to us about Alabama at Missouri, or Missouri well, at Alabama. Well, they kept them at under 50 points in this game. It was just 39 points they put on the board. But they had 550 yards of total offense in this game. Tua turned the ball over on a bad read and a sack fumble. But the key is, that's things that Nick can get on his football team about because guess what? Everybody's telling them how great they are, how invincible they are. They go out in this game and they made mistakes. The defense was outstanding. 183 total yards to Missouri and their quarterback. And not only that, just 10 points. There are things this team can work on. They aren't invincible, but they are the best college football team on the planet and this is one of those games where they got tested by some of their mistakes but they were just too strong and powerful on both sides of the ball for Missouri to keep up coach well they weren't emotionally ready to play the game but they are so good and Tua once again 265 yards three touchdowns and tweaks his knee but what made me delightful Jalen Hurst come in here's the starter who only lost two football games out of like 18 that he started has been demoted to second team he comes in Seven out of eight for 115 yards. Alabama will be ready. There's no doubt Alabama's looking forward to one game. That's LSU at Baton Rouge in a couple weeks. Now, after this game, uh, Alabama has an open date, as does LSU. They know that's such a big game because the people in LSU have still not forgiven uh, Nick Saban for leaving LSU, going to the pros, and coming from the Miami Dolphins back to Alabama. That bothers them to this day, and that is such a big game for LSU. That's when Alabama will be ready mentally. They weren't ready Saturday, but they don't have to be. You have to be the best team in the stadium, not the best team in the country each week. Coach, there's one thing that needs to be said about this, about Jalen Hurts. One thing that was always the problem with Jalen Hurts, he was a great runner with the quarter, with, at the quarterback position, but not a proficient passer. Now he's getting that opportunity to work on his passing skills. It's only going to make him a better quarterback down the road and Alabama a better football team down the road. Uh, there's no doubt about it. And Jalen Hurts has thrown the ball so much better this year. But Tua is just unbelievable. Yeah. I've never seen anybody dominate college football like he does. He's got a quick release. He has great vision. And not only that, this is probably the best group of receivers oh, Alabama's yeah. ever had. They yep. can run, they can catch, and they get a lot of big plays. Well, you're right, Coach. Tua is pretty much the answer, but he may be a little fragile. We don't know. We'll see as we move on. But Missouri did a great job in that sparring partner role for Alabama. Our next game, Colorado, undefeated Colorado, number 19 at USC. They're not undefeated anymore. Tough game out there, 31 to 20. Defense for USC, scored a touchdown. So, you know what, uh, maybe USC is coming back with that young quarterback. Mark, 
Talk to us about Well, the that star one. for Colorado, LaVisca Chenault Jr., has been outstanding on both sides. He's lined up at every position besides offensive line, and he's been dynamic. He still had 100 yards total all-purpose yards in this game, but USC was able to contain him most of the football game. JT Daniels played well, but it was an ugly game for USC. If you look at the points and look at what happened in this game, this game should have been a lot closer. USC was only 2 of 10 on third down in this football game. But the good thing is they still won the game by only rushing for 62 yards in this game. They found a way to win, and I think for Clay Helton, they had to get over that hump. I think that bye week helped them, but they still have to work on the penalties. 13 penalties in this football game. They're not going to get it done, and they've averaged 11 penalties per game. They've got to clean that up, Coach. Uh, USC won the football game. They'll probably win their division. Uh, I, I feel that, and I think they'll lose to Washington in the championship game, but be that as it may, uh, they have Southern Cal averaged 2.1 yards per rush for the game. But here's the amazing thing. I've never heard this statistic this high before. USC had four sacks and 16 tackles for losses. I mean, if you have more than three, that means you aren't dominating the line of scrimmage. All we ask our offensive line, give the back a chance to get the line of scrimmage untouched. So when you have 16 tackles for loss behind the line of scrimmage, you aren't going to win a football game. It was a great win for USC, but it was done on defense, not by offense. Credit young JT Daniels. He's about 17 or 18, I think, max years old, and threw two early interceptions and then recovered from that. So uh, maybe he will grow from that. Our next game, number 10, UCF, went to Memphis in the rain. Disney goes to Beale Street, Memphis Blues, and this was... This was a heartbreaker. This is a blue song in itself. 31 to 30, UCF sneaks a win. Mark, you saw this game. Talk I don't know. Us. Coach was really high on UCF. I think he was sweating it out there. They were behind the entire football game. To Mackenzie Milton made one heck of a play down on the goal line, sacrificed his body, got helicoptered around at the goal line, and scored the winning touchdown for UCF. Josh Heupel right now is still one of the good young coaches that's out there, but he's got to get his team ready to play each and every week. You can't give up over 280 yards rushing on the football in a football game, Coach, and expect to win. Memphis dominated this game, particularly on the down from the beginning of the game to the end of the fourth quarter and just got beat on a great drive by UCF at the end of the game. How in the world could you say Memphis dominated the football game when they scored zero points in the second half, Mark? They had 31 in the first half. That I want to tell you, this game has always been close. Memphis is a very talented football team. I still believe in UCF. I think this defense is better than last year. I think that Mackenzie Milton is a great player. He makes plays. He, he can run. He can throw. He's the leader of the football team. Make no mistake about it. Going into Memphis was not easy, uh, particularly when Memphis was primed for this football game. But UCF did win the game. And when you hold your opponent to zero points in the second half, that tells me you got a pretty good football team. Well, we have to decide if Texas is a pretty good football team because they were in our fourth game. The Baylor Bears and Matt Rule went into Austin and they almost caught the Longhorns napping. They were going to do some cow tipping, but you know what? 23-17, the Longhorns held out. So, Mark, you saw this game. Just tell you. Well, they're resilient as a football team in, in Texas. And if you look at the quarterback, Sam Ellinger went out early with a hand injury. Shane Bouchelle came in the game, played a decent football game, kept them going. Neither of these teams scored a point in the fourth quarter. I thought that was interesting that nobody could move the ball in the fourth quarter, put points on the board. But if you look at Texas on both sides of the ball, they're getting it done. They're more impressive to me now than they were at the beginning of the season. I thought they were going to be a 500 team, maybe get the seven wins this year. But the way that they've turned it around after the Maryland game, it's a different football team. They're not going into places like Baylor and, and going in with their B game. They're making sure that they find a way to win football games, Coach, and they're prepared each and every week no matter who they play. There was no letdown after the Oklahoma win. Anytime you win a football game, you have to walk away and say, that's great. And the best thing you can do as a football coach is, is to win a game very sloppy because you still have a win, but now you have the player's attention. All these things we have to work on, et cetera. And that's where Texas is right now. It wasn't a very impressive win, but let's give Baylor credit. I think they won one football game last year, and they throw the pass into the end zone on the last play of the game with a chance to win it. So it's nice for Texas, but you can't evaluate a football team after your first game. You couldn't evaluate Michigan after Notre Dame. You couldn't evaluate Texas after the Maryland loss. Memorial victories uh, usually don't add up to much, but I know what does. History, history. We talked about the land grant trophy. 
Michigan State is going to Penn State. And we went back to the history books. And what did we find out? We said that Michigan State was 6-1-1 one one when this game against Penn State was not played in November. And Coach, I really appreciate the compliment. That felt like a pat on the head because you said you appreciated my research and you said if you ever needed, you'd call me if you needed help with a crossword puzzle. But guess what? I got a crossword puzzle and I thought you could help me. And it says one across. It's an eight letter word that stands for the defenders of the nation of Sparta. Spartans! Michigan State went in to Happy Valley and guess what? They're now 7-1-1 against Penn State. The game's not played in November. And the land grant trophy, the beautiful thing that Mark and I think was made at the vocational school, but that beautiful thing is going to East Lansing. Mark, talk to us about that Brian game. Brian Lewicki was outstanding in this game throwing the football. He threw 52 times. That's not Michigan State football. Usually you run the football. And if you look at James Franklin, remember what he said after Ohio State? We need to become an elite football team. They definitely were not an elite football team against Michigan State because Michigan State has not played well the entire season. But the key in this football game is Trace McSorley, Coach. If you looked at him in his last game against Ohio State, was outstanding. We're patting him on the back. 460-plus yards of combined total all-purpose offense. He goes in this game and has less than half that against Michigan State. It was Michigan State's defense and their passing offense that won this football game for him in Happy Valley. But Penn State had this game. They had the game. Michigan State's backed up. There's only about a minute to go. And where the key in that game was on third down. Trace McSorley is running the ball, and he ends up going out of bounds. He stays in bounds. Michigan State has to use their last timeout. Then instead of getting the ball deep in their own territory, Michigan State, with no timeouts, minute 20 to go, they got it with a timeout. That made a big difference. And your defense has to play better. They're backed up. There's a minute to go. No timeouts. And they hit a 25-yard touchdown pass on the last play of the game. And you're going to say, yay, Michigan State. Yeah, that was a great throw. But I look at Penn State's defense. You know, some people say, at the end of the game, let's get in a prevent defense. Other people say, let's get in a victory defense. I call prevent victory. You've been defending them for 59 minutes. Why change? But no. They gave up too much yardage. I know, a heartbreaking loss for Penn State. Great win for Michigan State. Great comeback. I agree with him about, about Lou Werke. He competed tremendously. Maybe that's the last time Penn State overlooks an opponent and says, oh, we're not going to call a whiteout. We're going to beat that team. Michigan State hosts the Wolverines from Michigan. We'll talk about that in a second. Penn State at Indiana. Well, that's our rapid fire from week seven. Very quickly, gentlemen, let's talk about National championship picks, which we started back in week one. Mark, your national championship teams, Alabama, Clemson, Oklahoma, and Washington. Obviously, you've got Alabama win the whole thing, but Washington's out. you got to replace them. Yeah, it. I think I'm going to put the Wolverines in there, the way that they played. Everybody talks about their defense, but I'm talking about their offensive line. Coach mentioned that earlier. Their rushing attack, they're getting it done doing that way. And not only that, Shea Patterson has gotten much better each and every week. I think it's a comfortable fit with him at the quarterback position for the Wolverines. The way they're playing right now, I'm going to have to put them in, and I'm going to have to take Washington out. Coach. Don't go there. <laughs> go, I got to take Georgia. I got to take Georgia off my list. I got to replace them with Alabama. I, I, I thought Georgia would be much better this year. Uh, their performance down at LSU, I still think that they could go on to win the conference. They got to beat Florida. And uh, they beat Florida, then they get the chance to play Alabama for the championship. So I have to put Alabama in there. I, I will leave Ohio State in there, which I have. I will leave Notre Dame in there, and I will leave Clemson in there for the present time. Well, Coach Mark and I are going to have to check the rule book because uh, I think there's something about the college football show bylaws that you have to bid on Alabama if you didn't pick them before. But we'll talk about that <laughs> later. Gentlemen, there you have it. That was our review from week seven. It's exciting. Make sure you listen to it on our podcast, the Crowdsline College Football Show with Lou Holtz and Mark May podcast. 